Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this wonderful, great, celebratory day. This day celebrates the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. And we look forward to that time when he comes in the clouds to receive us himself. The Bible tells us we meet him in the air. The return of that Savior and our Messiah to reign on the earth. And we look forward to that very much. What are you doing here on a Monday morning? <laughs> I know why you are here. You're here because God has sanctified and set aside this day that his people might meet for a Sabbath. Only God can call any day a Sabbath. And he calls today a Sabbath. It is known as a high holy day. And here is where we ought to meet. We have to remember that what God says, as we said a couple of days ago, God means. And if he says it, we have got to sound it. So thank God for your being here today. And thank God for setting aside this day for us that we might rejoice and be glad in him. You know, none of God's holy days are optional. All of God's holy days are commanded. You have a right and an obligation to be here today. And glad you are. We're sorry for those who are not here for one cause or another, but God's people have got to be here on the day he has sanctified as a holy day. And thank God for it. The ways of God are different, brethren. We are different. We've got to be able to be glad of our difference, not to be smug, not to be haughty, not to feel holier than thou, but thank God he has opened our eyes to see his truth and to see his direction. Had he not done that, we would, like, we would, have, we would be like those who sleep, those who do not understand God's way of life. But God has made it clear to us that he wants us to be different because we are his people. The subject today is an unusual one, but it is one that you soon get to understand and see why it is what it is. It is that all he knew. That's the subject. That's all he knew. All friends and family, when they see us do these supposedly strange things, they want to know what's wrong with Johnny. What's wrong with Barbara? What's wrong with Oliver? We do what God has revealed to us to do. And we are obligated to do it and to do it with intensity. Today, we talk about that man who was struck by God on the road to Damascus. His name was Saul. He met Jesus Christ face to face, as it were. We met Jesus Christ when we were converted, or as we understand in God's church, when we were called by God. And when Saul got that calling, when Saul got that clarity, when Saul got that understanding, he was committed to this way of life. It is for us similarly to be committed to this way of life. When he was told, told by the early church, the importance of this day, he did all that he knew. The very first book Saul, who became Paul, wrote is First Thessalonians. And I want to point out to you today from this entire book how caught up, how involved, how secure, and how focused Paul was on the second coming of Christ. All of the writers of uh, commentary say that first and second Thessalonians are the very first books plural, that Paul wrote. And the theme, the focus of these two books is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I want to show you today from 1 Thessalonians how focused, 
and how central this theme was to the Apostle Paul. That's why we say that's all he knew. He was not double visioned. He was not sideswiped. He was not thinking of anything else when they told him that Jesus Christ, whom he met on the road to Damascus, was coming back. That became his focus. And in writing to the Thessalonians, I want to show you today how much this book is laced with his attention on the second coming of Jesus Christ. You know, it will do you good to read a book at a time. I know you couldn't read all of Psalms in one sitting. You may not be able to read all of Deuteronomy in one sitting. But these smaller epistles, epistles, one Sunday school kid was asked, of course with a group of children in the class, what are the epistles? I know, sir, I know, I know. Yes, boy, what, what are the epistles? Oh, they were the wives of the apostles. Of course not. But the epistles are very important. The writings of Paul and Peter and all the others who made great contributions to that compilation of books. In 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, let's begin as he begins this book of 89 verses, 5 chapters, and one-tenth of this entire book, 1 Thessalonians, deals with the second coming of Jesus Christ. How focused was this man? How caught up was this man with this second, with this chapter, with this subject? 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. <clears throat> For they themselves show off so, of us, what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the true and living God. Isn't that a testimony? When we came to know God, did we turn from all the idols that beset and surrounded our lives? Hopefully we did, or we are doing it. But Paul could say to these Thessalonians, when they came to know God and understand God's way, they turned from idols. Hopefully there are no more idols in your life. You should turn from them to serve the true and the living God. Verse 10, and to wait in anticipation. Here is the first salvo on the subject of the return of Jesus Christ. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. There's no doubt who this person is. This is Jesus Christ himself. Even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So here in verse 10, he is saying that you are called to wait for his son from heaven. And that is the focus of the church of God. That is our expectation. That is our life. That we wait for the Son of God from heaven who will come to bring us and save us from the wrath of God to come. Wrath? Why would you associate wrath with God? God has several facets. To his personality, his, final, his focus is on love, for so God is love. But God can be filled with wrath if he has to. You remember the antediluvian world, the age of Noah? God permitted the heavens to open. Talking about heavens opening, we should breathe a prayer for those in Jamaica and Haiti that are facing the ravages of the rain and the water and the wind 
And the antediluvian world saw the terror and the wrath of God upon the people who have sinned so greatly against him. God can be a God of wrath. So Paul is saying here to these Thessalonians that you've turned from serving idols to serve the true and living God and to wait for his son from heaven to save us from the wrath to come. Chapter 1. Turn, if you will, into chapter 2. This man is filled with the subject of the return of Jesus Christ. That's why I said you should read these smaller books in their entirety, maybe in one sitting. I have done that several times this passing week, and I discovered how caught up, how involved and focused he is about the return of Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians chapter 2, find verse 19. You will see that he's telling these Thessalonians about the return of Jesus Christ. No wonder the writers said that the theme of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians is the return of Jesus Christ in all of his glory, in all of his power, that we will behold if we are focused on our calling and focused on our God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 19. I know it's in here. That's why I'm looking so feverishly and so intensely for it. I know you might have found it before me, but I'll be there shortly. What the kid says in the back seat, in the back seat, are we there yet? Well, we're just about. Verse 19. For what is our hope or joy? Our crown of rejoicing are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. Is this man focused or not? Is this book saturated by Paul, his very first book? The compilers tell us there are only 89 verses in here. And here he is again in the second chapter talking about the fact that our hope, our calling, our expectation is Jesus Christ at his coming. Brethren, let your focus like Paul be on the return of Jesus Christ. I know we get caught up in our activities per day. We get caught up in the mundane. But like these Thessalonians, like the Apostle Paul, let us focus on the fact that Jesus Christ is coming to save us from this world, this world of sin, this world that's headed for no place good. <coughs> let us look forward to Jesus Christ to be the Savior of mankind and to deliver us from the evil to come. There is a third chapter to this book. Find it, if you will. Chapter 3, verse 3. That no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed There unto verse thirteen. What's that verse? Verse thirteen. We look forward as we are enjoined, as we said on Sabbath, Saturday Sabbath, that we heard from the three mouths the same message of the coming of Christ. And so Paul is saying to these Thessalonians that they too should continue their focus as he was on the return of Jesus Christ in all of his glory, in all of his power, to take unto himself 
those whom he's called. Verse 13, to the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father. There it is. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. You can't tell me that Paul was not focused on what we should be focused on, the return of Jesus Christ, that he might reserve and preserve our hearts in holiness. That we might be remembering that we are a holy people. We have been called of God to meet a holy Christ and a holy God when the kingdom of God is established here on the earth. So Paul is saying to these Thessalonians, he is saying to us as a reminder that our focus should be on the heavens, knowing that soon our Savior Jesus Christ will come and take us unto himself, as he said that where I am, they may be also. Okay, chapter 4, it continues relentlessly painting the picture that Christ will come again. Chapter 4, nearly at every funeral, though this is not a funeral, this passage is read because of its meaning and because of its clarity in saying what will eventually happen. Chapter 4, look at verse Beginning at verse 15. You're in the book already. Chapter 4. Verses 15 through 18. Poignant. Meaningful. Clarity. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the here it is unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep there will be people alive when Jesus Christ breaks the cloud and comes back to the earth there will be people alive oh how we would all like that but we've got to pass through the shadow of death to get to the other side of the promise. Verse 16. For the Lord himself. Wasn't that what we read in Acts 1. 10 and 11 on the Sabbath. For the Lord himself. Not another. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven. With a shout. With the voice of the archangel. And with the trump of God. Why did he call today the piece of trumpets? Because the trumpets shall be sounded and Jesus Christ will come back to earth. The word says he will appear in the air. Many teach that he's coming on that occasion will not be back to the earth. He will appear in the air and we who are still alive, hopefully we'll all be still alive, that will be wonderful, wouldn't it be? So be caught up in the air to meet him. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Paul goes on to say, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So Christ is coming. It's sure. It's promised. And it will occur. So in this entire book, Paul saturates us with the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. We said there are 89 verses, five chapters. Let's find chapter five and see if he continues this relentless outpouring of clarification, making the saints in Thessalonica know that indeed he is coming. Shut the trumpets, shout the word, he's coming. Chapter five. Let's look at verse 2 to begin. 
for yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Didn't Jesus refer to the return of Christ as a thief in the night? Here Paul is referring to the same event, the same occasion. And he says that he shall come as a thief in the night. And if we're ready, we'll be ready to go with him. Now, let's drop down toward the end of this chapter. As he ends this chapter, he's not done. First, did you find it yet? <laughs> How can you find it if I didn't tell you? I'm trying to find it before you do. <laughs> chapter 5 and verse 23. That's all he knew, that Christ was coming again, and it thrilled him. So he had to convey in his very first book the seriousness, the expectation that God's people should have for the return of our Savior to meet with us in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Verse 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, Sanctify is set aside, preserve, purify you, holy. And I pray God, your Holy Spirit and soul and body. When I was in theology school one morning, the professor came in and said, No man, what are you, a dichotomist or a trichotomist? I don't remember if I studied that night in study period. And I was grasping for dichotomy, dichotomy. Try is three. And Paul mentions here body, soul, and spirit be preserved. Why? Blameless. Until the coming. of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, may we like Paul catch the vision that indeed Jesus Christ will return to the earth to make his saints his family. We are already his family, but we will then be dwelling with him when he sets up the kingdom of God. That's all, all new. And may God give us the focus, the vision, and the centrality to know that this is the next big event in the work of God and the church of God.